in business, Zainab Ahmed, Nigeria's Minister of Finance, on Monday announced plans by the government to raise $6.9 billion from the multilateral lenders to help efforts to stop the spread of the coronavirus and counter its impact on Africa's largest economy. In the same breath, rating agency Fitch has seconded S&P as it downgrades Nigeria's long-term foreign currency issuer default rating IDR to B from B+, with a negative outlook citing external and fiscal pressures. These are indeed trying times for the Nigerian economic space. I'm now joined by Dr. Josh Bamfor, partner and head transfer pricing at Anderson Tax. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Now, what, what is your view of, of the mid to the long-term impact of COVID-19 on Nigeria? Um, to actually analyze this, I think it's important that um, we have a sense of the sources of this impact. Now, the first um, source of impact is the external shock that we've been facing, all right, which technically we call the exogenous shocks. And it started as far out as January, you know, when China had severe case of COVID-19 pandemic and therefore had to take restrictive measures. By taking those restrictive measures, which included lockdown, what happened was the fact that, you know, the demand for crude oil dropped significantly and that led to the drop in the price of crude oil. With Nigeria being highly dependent on export of crude oil in order to generate revenue in terms of executing our budget, as well as as a major source of forex, this had an adverse impact on the economy. In addition to that was the fact that there was disruption in the supply chain. China happens to be one of our major trading partners. So in terms of importation of finished goods or some intermediate um, products of uh, raw materials for the manufacturing sector, the trade industry, we had significant disruptions. Then we also have some endogenous shocks, which are also called internal shocks. Um, because we were importing this COVID disease, we had to ban international travels. That had a direct adverse impact on industries such as aviation and hotel industry. Then we had to, you know, um, also um, ban large gatherings. And by banning large gatherings, we had some um, sectors also impacted, such as restaurants and all informal businesses that linked with large gatherings, such as weddings and so on and so forth. Finally, the state of Lagos had to go into a lockdown which meant that only essential goods or services could actually be operational, which also affected other sectors of the economy. So if you look at the combination of both the exogenous or external factors plus the endogenous or internal factors, then we have a very big problem on our hands. So clearly there's going to be an immediate impact. And that immediate impact is the fact that a number of sectors have been directly been adversely impacted. Oil and gas, aviation, hoteling, and so on and so forth. However, there's going to be a rippling effect across the whole economy, just like what we experienced in 2016 when we had a recession, which would then lead to the whole economy potentially entering into a recession. So the medium-term impact is the fact that clearly there's going to be a slowdown of the economy as an offshoot of trying to curb this you know, COVID-19 pandemic. And it's instructive that the government actually intervenes to ensure that whatever pain that we go through you know, it's not, um, does not drag too long to put us in a very bad situation. Now, Josh, th th you know pretty well that the government is said to raise about $6.9 billion from multilateral lenders to fight the pandemic. Do you think this is a panic move or an, an absolutely necessary requirement? Clearly, if you look at the enormity of this problem we have on our hands, all right, you can never say this is a panic move. In fact, this is a necessary requirement. It's a necessary evil. As I said, we are dealing with two um, challenges now. First is to actually contain and control the spread of COVID-19. And we've seen its impact on economies in Europe, as well as in China and in the US. It's, kind of, it's just catastrophic, all right? So you cannot understate its potential adverse impact. So clearly we need all you know, hands on deck. Now, also re re recognize that with the decrease in oil prices and, the, and also the decrease in the demand for crude oil, and with oil sector usually contributing around 70% to our tax revenue, already the government has a shortfall in terms of its projection of tax revenue in order to actually combat this COVID-19 um, um, pandemic, as well as um, um, you know, execute some of the planned expenditures they had at the beginning of the year. So there's already gonna be a huge budget deficit 
that government has to finance through borrowing. All right, now, if you go and borrow in the capital market, and we're going to talk about that later on, you know, more about that later on, okay. and your um, credit rating as a nation has already been downgraded, then the interest rate on those um, treasury bonds are going to be very high. Luckily for us, oh, sorry, we do have to international to check, financial Josh, institutions let me interject here, such Josh. as the World Bank, can you hear me, Josh? IMF. Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, you just rightly said it. Um, w w Nigeria currently have been downgraded by the Fitch ratings. And, and joining S&P uh, in the downgrade of Nigeria's credit ratings into a, a junk territory, don't you think this will potentially impact the economy negatively? It, it, it will, definitely. But then um, going back to the previous point, because um, of that downgrade and because it's going to be more costly for Nigeria to borrow in the capital market, because it's going to go at a higher um, interest rate. That's the only way investors are going to be interested in our treasury bonds. It's important that Nigeria takes advantage of all the concessional loans that they can get from these international and um, financial institutions, such as the World Bank, IBF, African Development Bank, and the Islamic Development Bank. Those type of loans are concessional loans, which means that they come at very low interest rates. So they need to exhaust that option before they go to the capital markets, given that they have a bad credit rating. Already we know that World Bank has made available around 90 million facility that we can tap into. We've already made use of 8 million. So we have another 82 that we can um, take advantage of. The Minister of Finance also talked about being able to apply for an additional 100 million from the World Bank. There's also the IMF that has this um, um, rapid credit facility that you can get access to loans at a very low interest rate because of this COVID issue. African Development Bank has actually issued a social bond, the largest of its kind, and raised three billion U.S. dollars to help African countries to deal with COVID. This, in, the interest rate on that bond was just 0.75, which means that African countries can have access to this at very low interest rates. So clearly, what government has to do is to, to take advance, advantage of these concessional loans. I don't think they are going to be enough then before they actually go into the capital market to actually raise more funds in order to finance the deficit and also curb the potential economic fallout of this COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Josh Bamford, thank you for joining us on News on the Hour and for your insightful contribution. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.